Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's Northwest ATTC webinar. Um, I'm Meg Bruner, and I'm your host for today. We're excited to have Sean Mahoney from Oregon with us presenting today about how peers talk about harm reduction. Before we get started, just a few quick housekeeping things. Um, next slide, Sean. Are you there, Sean? Oh, sorry, I see your mouse moving. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Hold on. Okay. There we go. Perfect. Um, so first, if you have any questions for Sean today, feel free to type them into the chat box. Uh, Sean will address questions at the end, so I'll just read them out to him at the end and he'll answer them and we'll go in the order that they were received for the most part. Um, next slide. Uh, you'll also be getting an email this afternoon that will have the slides and a link where you can get the recording from today, which should be available by Friday at the latest. In that email, you'll also find a link to a short survey. If you can please take that survey, we were grateful. It helps us make sure we're bringing you the information you're most interested in. Um, next slide. And additionally, we'll also be sending everyone who attends the webinar today a certificate of attendance. This takes us about a week to send out. You don't need to do anything to receive one except be here and stick around. They'll be automatically sent to the email you use to register. If you're watching this in a group um, using just a single login though, you'll wanna send us the names and email addresses for everyone in that group who wants a certificate. If you can do that within one business day, that would be awesome. Our email is there on the slide. It's northwest at attcnetwork.org. Um, and with that, I'll introduce our speaker for today. Sean Mahoney is a peer support specialist, recovery mentor, program manager, and peer supervisor for the Mental Health and Addiction Association of Oregon. Sean has been sober since 2009 and also works as a writer, facilitator, and advocate. Also, importantly, in his bio, Sean informed us that he has a cat named Larry. I'm extremely sorry to say that I have reviewed Sean's slides for today and there are no pictures of Larry in them, clearly an oversight. However, <laughs> Despite the lack of Larry pictures, I think this is going to be a really great presentation, and I am super excited to have you here and to get to learn from you today, Sean. So take it away whenever you are ready. Someone posted, uh, bring us Larry in the chat. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction, Meg. Uh, like Meg said, I am Sean Mahoney. I am a peer supervisor and program manager for the Mental Health and Addiction Association of Oregon. I'm also a certified recovery mentor and a peer wellness specialist. Um, and today we're gonna to be talking about Beyond Clean Needles, how peers talk about harm reduction. Um, and first, uh, a tribal land acknowledgement before we get started. In applying a lens of cultural humility to issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, Northwest ATTC, offers this land acknowledgement for today's event. Our work intends to reach the addiction workforce in HHS region 10, Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. This area rests on traditional territories of many indigenous nations, including tribal groups with whom the United States signed treaties prior to granting of statehoods. Please join us in support of efforts to affirm tribal sovereignty and in displaying respect and gratitude for our indigenous neighbors. So here's a few things that we say that we don't even know that we're saying, but we say them all the time. And they're little things that we say to take care of one another. Like, uh, what do you say when somebody says they're flying out of town, right? They have a safe flight. Uh, when the person who hands you a coffee at Starbucks, hopefully, they'll say, careful, that's really, really hot. Or when somebody says, God, I'm really struggling, I need to take a day off, you just say, well, take care of yourself, right? And fundamental stuff like um, wearing your seatbelt, buckle up. I think we've been hearing that since we were four or five years old, correct? So I believe really at the core of every harm reduction conversation is our human innate desire to care for one another. Things like saying drive safe, careful, it's really hot. Do you need a mask? Are you okay to drive? These are our little tiny ways that we tell one another we care about 
each other and I care about your safety and I want you to be okay. And harm reduction conversations, I believe, come from this same desire too, or they should come from the same desire. So a little about peers and harm reduction. So first of all, what is peer support? I know there's a lot of peers on this uh, call today and it's nice to see them all here, but I think we live in a bubble where we talk about this stuff and we assume everyone knows what peer support is. I uh, worked as a peer and direct service for a long time at OHSU, a hospital here in Portland, Oregon. And um, sometimes I'd walk into a room all happy, this guy in recovery saying like, I'm your peer. And they're like, what the heck is that? And basically peer support is a person with lived experience, either with addiction or mental health, or if you're lucky and hit the genetic lottery like myself, you have both, um, who walks people through whatever they're going through. We meet people where they're at. Again, we over say that, like, what does that even mean? But I think meeting people where they're at it, that's the essence of harm reduction. That means meeting people if they where they're at, if they want to continue using, if they don't want to take medication for their mental health conditions, if they're unhoused. That's really what peer support does. We need people um, and walk alongside them with whatever their goals might be. So real quick about who I am. Like I said, I'm, uh, I work inside of this uh, world of mental health and addiction, and I have for over five years. Um, I am also a person uh, in long-term recovery. I, my sobriety date is January 2nd, 2009. So it'll be 14 years unless something real bad happens between now and New Year's Day. Um, and uh, I come from a long line of folks who struggle with substances and mental health. I also um, live with uh, depression and PTSD. And I am a long-term survivor of HIV. I got my diagnosis the year I got sober. Um, and uh, so I became a peer when I moved to Portland in 2017. Um, I kind of fell into this work, as we said in my bio at the beginning, I am a freelance writer. Uh, the thing about freelance writing is the free part is often the case. And uh, I need something stable, but something that I was passionate about and helping other people and particularly our people who live with the things that I have is something I'm really passionate about. Um, so I fell kind of into this role and um, have loved every minute of it because I like the work that we get to do. So why peers when we talk about peers and harm reduction? Like why can't it just be a pamphlet that somebody gives them? Or why can't it be, why can't the harm reduction thing just be something that a doctor says? And I think while we see that happen, I think how it's really fallen into the lap of peers or what I have noticed over the years of doing this work is because we have this dialogue. We speak this language. We know what it's like to want to continue to use. So, so often these conversations fall on us. Like I said, while I was working in the hospital, we had these conversations all the time. And while a social worker or a nurse could talk to a patient about clean needles, um, and they might hear it, it would be drastically different with somebody with lived experience saying, hey, I care about you and I don't care if you keep using, but what can we do to keep you safe? And so that's really the building block right there and why peers are important in this conversation. And so um, peers really can, like I said, kind of knock down the barriers that maybe a doctor or a clinician can't. Peers also have access to resources and uh, no different routes to help people or in, in enmeshed usually inside of a community that can help folks too, that maybe a clinician might not know about. And then lastly, we bring our own lived experience to the conversation where we can share our own story about where we practice harm reduction in our lives, if anywhere. I think in one way or another, while we were all actively using there was some sort of harm reduction going on. And I'll get into my own version of that in a minute. But, you know, some of the struggles that peers face doing this work and working in this world, uh, you know, there's a lot of stigma still for people um, in recovery and people who use drugs. Uh, I think peers face that. I think peers, again, a lot of people don't know what work we do and who we are and what we bring to the table working inside of a hospital 
I think uh, you walk into rooms and people say, who is this? Why is this guy here? Why isn't he dressed like us? Um, and so, and then there's also the real burnout that we face, you know, and secondary trauma. We're walking alongside people right now in the middle of a massive overdose crisis. And so um, we're taking on all of these things that can be triggering. I know that's an overused word, but for us doing the work, it definitely tends to apply. So, and then, you know, lastly, I think a big struggle that we face is, uh, being paid, right? Like peers not being paid enough or not having enough opportunity or education. That's changing a little bit here in Oregon. But I think that's some of the stuff that we, some of the struggles that we face. So some harm reduction starting points, and this is really about the conversation. You guys know all of the things. This is about having the conversation and not about the sciencey resource kind of stuff. Uh, this is really about what this conversation looks like. And the starting point for this conversation, in my experience, is compassion. You know, just because someone uses drugs uh, does not mean they are um, undeserving of compassion. Um, when we are able to show up for people with compassion when others are not, uh, that lands, that means something. When we walk in with compassion and non judgment, and uh, are there just to listen and um, offer support, it really changes the dynamic. You know, when you tell people you're still using, you are often uh, faced with a fear response, right? You're faced with a, oh my God, why? You need to stop doing that. You're killing yourself. All those things that we hear when we're actively using and that we know, and that while they may be true, they're not helpful. And so when someone says, okay, um, that's fine. I don't judge you. And what do you need? And that's really the dignity piece too. You know, so much of harm reduction as well as peer support um, is based in social justice and advocacy. And, you know, there's dignity that people who use drugs deserve. Um, you know, just because someone is uh, using drugs doesn't mean they deserve to not be treated in, a, in an emergency room. That just because someone uses drugs does not mean they don't have the rights as everyone else. So we as peers get to give them the dignity um, that they deserve. And I think anybody having a harm reduction conversation, we turn into advocates for these people because we're saying your life means something. Even though you're using, your life means something. And that is a rebellious message when you break that down, because what we've been hearing since the 80s and the war on drugs is that drugs are bad and people who use drugs are bad. So by saying against that, that like, no, people who use drugs matter, um, that in itself is advocacy. And you know, love is a cornerstone of this too, um, that we uh, love our people and we love our community and we want to keep both of those things safe. That's a really big guiding principle here. And you know, if you don't leave with anything else, I really wanna press the point of, there's nothing controversial about wanting to keep people safe. And um, you know, there isn't. And that is, that goes all the way across the board. You know, so there shouldn't be stigma around this. And so um, if you're hit with stigma, just remember there's nothing controversial about wanting to keep people safe. So, so much of what we do as peers when we show up at on the um, in the community or in a clinic or in a hospital is leading with our own story. That's kind of uh, what one of the old social workers I used to work with would say is our secret sauce, like the thing that we get to bring to the table. And um, and and so, leading with my own story, you know, like I said, um, I used drugs and drank for a very long time. I started. Um, drinking at age 14. I come from an alcoholic home. I did not get sober until I was 36 years old. Uh, in that time frame of using, had problematic relationships with everything from cocaine to cannabis to meth and beyond. But really at the end, it was primarily cocaine and alcohol. And, um, you know, harm reduction in my own life, while I was using, 
I would practice, um, you know, cutting down drinks uh, when I was drinking all the time or finding days where I could drink less. Also, I didn't drive specifically because I did not want to get behind a um, automobile and hurt other people. There's a history of like gnarly drunk driving accidents in my Irish family, and I did not want to be another one. Um, and then the other thing too, as a person who snorted drugs, I um, had a hole caused by my drug use inside of my nose. So once I discovered that, I started trying to um, use less or not use that side of my nose. Um, and then also in my own life, you know, my mom, who is in her 70s, Carol, which is a very mom name, um, she, again, alcoholism being all over my family. Um, a few years ago, my aunt, who drank her entire life, uh, her body started to shut down because of alcoholism. And um, my, she pretty much made it clear to everyone in our family that she wanted to drink until the end. Uh, while the other people in my family really freaked out, something inside of my mom, again, 70-something Carol from Arizona, who doesn't know harm reduction, practiced harm reduction with my aunt. She said, okay, like, what can we do to keep you safe? So she talked my aunt into agreeing to turn over her driver's license. She helped um, get my aunt connected to her neighbors that could who could bring her alcohol and another neighbor who brought her cigarettes. And then my aunt would come by and bring her, my other aunt would come by and bring her water. So like my mom really came up with a plan to keep my aunt and her community safe because of the wishes that she had and the way that she wanted to keep using. Um, my aunt eventually passed away um, due to alcoholism, uh, but she died on her own terms. And she died knowing that somebody heard her and that was my mom. And so, um, you know, uh, uh, harm reduction conversations in my work life were vast. Anybody who's worked in a hospital setting as a peer knows that um, these things happen all the time and sometimes on the fly. I think one of the most powerful ones I ever had, though, was a man who uh, used heroin and um, lived in a very rural part of Oregon in a essentially like a trailer in the forest and he had cancer that which was terminal and he wanted to continue using um again his family had a lot of fear around that what i found over the years is that when you tell people that you want to keep using drugs or you hear that the first thing you get hit with is fear from other people because they're afraid for your life and they're afraid for your health and sometimes that fear manifests in some like crazy dysfunctional reactionary ways but um his family was very upset when he expressed this over and over again uh the social worker I was working with and myself really switched into a plan of figuring out how to keep this gentleman safe and how he could continue to use and had direct conversations with him and said okay buddy well uh, what's the story with clean water for your needles? Turns out there wasn't a story. So we figured out someone in his community that could help him with clean water. We figured out another person that he knew who went to a methadone clinic who could help get him clean needles. Uh, we, but we only figured these things out because we were able to like talk to him as somebody who deserved respect and expressed our concerns for him, even though he used drugs. Um, uh, the man eventually passed away, uh, but again, on his own terms, and he didn't die because of complications of his drug use. Uh, he never returned to the hospital because of complications from his own drug use, too. So I think that's worth mentioning. Uh, other conversations that I had at work were, um, you know, there was a gentleman that I worked with for a long time who injected meth. And by the time I met him, his veins were very much out of business. Uh, he was feisty. And uh, as are a lot of people who wind up in the hospital and aren't able to use meth for a few days, they get a little feisty. It's totally understandable. And um, But he eventually uh, warmed up to me. And while before he was discharging, 
we kind of threw it on the table of like, look, dude, like, what does it look like to like maybe smoke meth for a minute and give your veins a rest and give your body a rest as much as you can give yourself a rest with meth. But, you know, like, how, what does that look like? And he was super resistant to it. He said it didn't work for him. He hated it. He wasn't on board with it. But the more we kind of talked to him and not just about that, and like, it wasn't about harassing him into making a decision or any of that. It was really just building a rapport with him and talking to him addict to addict and more than that, human to human, right? Which anybody can do. Um, he decided to try it. He uh, decided to try it and continue to try it. I don't know if he's still smoking meth, but I worked with him for a long time in the community. Um, again, he didn't wind up back in the hospital. So I think like these conversations are worth having. And, um, you know, inside of the hospital too, like talking to people about uh, Narcan, talking to people about uh, not just clean needles, but uh, alcohol and everything else. Like I, it happened on a regular basis. And the biggest thing I discovered in these conversations is that I really had to put my own bias and fear aside and really just talk to somebody who cared about them and wanted to keep them safe. So that goes into being real. And I think being real is the cornerstone of great peer support and great support in general, right? Like I love the friends of mine and the people that I have in my life who will, in a loving way, <laughs> tell me uh, how it is and tell me um, uh, if they're concerned about me. And I think, you know, being direct, which we laugh about here in Portland, Oregon, uh, you know, passive aggressiveness is our state bird around here. So, uh, but being direct is very hard for some people. And I think we, we confuse being direct with being mean but it's not the case, you know, like being direct is saying like, hey, don't step in front of a truck or hey, put your seatbelt on or hey, you know, like those kinds of things. And also just being like, this is what's going on. This is what's happening. So much of the time inside of the hospital, there would be um, medical professionals with an entire plan for a person that didn't include that person. And my job as a peer would be to advocate for that person and say, hey, listen, just so you know, this is what everybody thinks you should do. They're not going to tell you that, but I care about you. So I'm going to be direct with you. And harm reduction is the same way. Just being direct is saying like, hey, I know you want to keep using. That's cool. What do we do? What's the plan? And, you know, that goes into be getting specific. Like I said earlier about the gentleman who lived in rural Oregon. Get real specific. Where are you getting the water from? How many times a week do you drink? What's going on with snorting? Can you still um, inject drugs at all? Where are you getting your supply from? Are you using alone? Like having those gnarly, scary, kind of like detailed conversations really like express that you care about another person because you're willing to go there when maybe other people in their life are not willing to go there. And just saying like, hey, so yeah, you know, I guess anybody could throw clean needles at somebody or give them an address to a needle exchange, but it takes somebody who really cares about them to say like, okay, so what's going on? How do we do this? Because a lot, when you really get into those conversations, there's not a plan, there's not access, they haven't really thought about what's next. And so by going there with someone, um, it really like, knocks down the walls and it becomes more about supporting people and asking questions you know ask all of the questions that you need to ask as far as um they're not just like how they're using but like what's going on at home and what's going on with the other people in your life who are also using and what what do all the things look like um and what are the barriers how do you get to places you know um do you have electricity? Like those kinds of things, like just asking all the questions and, um, you know, doing our research too. I think 
uh, inside of our world and in the five years, and I'll get into more of this in a minute, but in the five years I've been doing this work, I've seen this all drastically change. Uh, you know, the conversations that we used to have about substances are wildly different uh, because of what's on the street now than they were five years ago. You know, it was a simple cut and dried answer before, but now because of things changing, it looks very different. So doing my own research and reading things um, has really been beneficial to me. And then also not just about that, not just about substances and what's happening on the street and different things policy wise, but like we're looking up new um, places for people to get clean needles or new, uh, where do people get MAT from or how, what are the social service things? Where can people get a food box? All of those things, like just researching community stuff for our people. I think coming armed with research and uh, resources shows again that you've cared and that you uh, have really thought about the person and what their needs are. All right, so this is a break, just a little break to put any questions that you enjoy our break answers, any questions that you have inside of the chat. And we're gonna get there in a minute. We'll ask, answer as many as we can at the end. And just to take a little breather, I realize too, it for people who may have experienced loss to folks in their lives because of overdose, some of these conversations are rough, even hearing about them abstractly. I get that. I understand that. So this is a moment too to breathe through those feelings if anything has come up. Take a little breath. All right. And we're going to keep moving. So uh, in the spirit of getting specific, uh, let's break down substance by substance, y'all. I think, again, too, from a clinical standpoint, there's a lot of people who maybe don't have lived experience who think harm reduction is a great idea, but um, they have a very limited view on what that looks like. So what I have found over the years, um, having these conversations with people is uh, really, it, it looks different for whatever people are using. And it also looks different now because of what's going on. So first of all, with heroin and opioids, you know, all the basics, uh, clean needles, clean water, alcohol wipes, talking again about alternate alternative routes, of use, you know, instead of injecting, smoking, all of the things, you know, the, the stuff that, again, your basic harm reduction 101 pamphlet, all helpful, all great, wonderful, all very true. Um, figuring out where needle exchanges are in your area, uh, super helpful, great. And even having clean needles, if you can get some to hand out to other people, really great. This was kind of our blueprint for a very long time having this conversation. And even when I was, before I moved to the hospital, working as a peer at a crisis center here in Oregon and Clackamas County, that was kind of like the basic that I knew is like those things at the top of this list. And that was sort of it. And then, you know, that was like 2017 when I started this work. And by the time I had moved to the hospital in late 2017, 2018, the conversation had already been changed because a giant plot twist had happened, right? And fentanyl came along and, and fentanyl suddenly was everywhere. And um, we started to shift what we were telling people all of these years. And a absolutely like, mic drop happened of like oh wait you know because of all of these people suddenly dying from smoking fentanyl laced pills the blue pills anybody around here knows what the blue pills are um uh there's a moment in time where it was like a head scratcher i remember having a conversation with different clinicians and different people in recovery and peers saying like, you know, it was an odd point in history uh, 
it's like 2020, that it was actually safer to shoot heroin than it was to smoke heroin laced with fentanyl. Very bizarre. It totally changed. And so really the conversation about the dangers of smoking those things and what does that look like? You know, how do you even get into that? Well, the basic there and with fentanyl in general, <clears throat> one of the building blocks of the fentanyl conversation and the safety of fentanyl conversation is starting with using less, right? Like uh, I always say you can't like get less high, <laughs> but you could get more high. So like if seeing what that looks like for the person that you're talking to, could you cut it in half? Could you cut it in quarters? See what happens. They might be resistant to that idea, but really just explaining like, you know, the large dose could be potentially fatal and just breaking that down for people. Um, and then uh, not using alone. So the deaths that I know from fentanyl in my own personal life of people that I care about have happened from folks um, using alone. A good friend of mine named Dylan uh, died in 2020 um, smoking uh, fentanyl and uh, he was by himself. And Dylan was much loved and had a huge group of people who cared about him. And one of the things we all just like kicked ourselves over was, um, you know, that we never checked in and saw like, who was he using with? Who was he hanging out with? And it turns out it was nobody. So, um, you know, uh, I think that's a big thing to push with people. You know, um, we see this with unhoused folks a lot. They really do take care of one another. And so uh, I don't know the statistics, but I would be interested to see like what that looks like because so many people who are living in tent communities kind of use with each other. And we have personal experience on the teams that I supervise of actually lives being saved by folks who got Narcan from one of my teams and were able to revive a person that they were with who overdosed. So that really is like a huge endorsement for not using alone. And um, just talking to people about that. And there is a line called never use alone. Uh, you can basically be on the, fine, the phone with never use alone and use and uh, give them permission to call EMS if uh, you stop responding. So there are resources. I think the bigger resource that we have as peers and providers is really connecting to a community and seeing, um, talking to people and using motivational interviewing and finding out what their uh, natural supports are and who the people are around them who can uh, help them stay safe while they're using. And then also acknowledging that people like the effects of fentanyl. There is this boogeyman idea, and while true in a lot of cases, that you know that someone was going around like sprinkling fentanyl and everything, and it was an accidental thing, and, and people weren't enjoying it. And while in certain substances, it is a surprise, but what we have found over the years and one of my peers who was working out of the jails once this blue pill thing kind of exploded uh, was talking to one of the people in there. And he was saying, look, like, it's like we were using heroin, but then something 50 times stronger came along. We're not going to go back to using heroin. And so acknowledging that there's an effect that people like by using it and then circling back to, OK, then how do we keep them safe? Like taking out our own misinformation and bias around fentanyl and all the crazy things that people say about fentanyl, you know, and all the crazy videos that you see about like a cop who allegedly touched it and then passed out, like all the things. Like, I think we go to the source of people who are actually using it and find out why, right? And find out what they're getting out of it and how do we keep them safe? And moving back there. And then chief among that is uh, naloxone, aka Narcan, and showing people how to use it. Like I mentioned with that story, um, having uh, unhoused people um, revive one another. Uh, it's a bigger conversation now than it was. And once 
uh, when I was in the hospital, I early days, um, I went with a social worker to give Narcan to someone. It's maybe the first time I'd ever done it. I was still very young in this work. And um, the guy got really upset. He is really mad. He started yelling at us and was saying that, you know, like we were assuming that he was going to overdose. And the social worker that I worked with at the time masterfully redirected the conversation and said, no, 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 no. This isn't for you because first of all, you can't revive yourself, but it's for your community. It's for the other people around you who also use. And to watch his body language change and his tone of voice change. And, and then he started saying stuff like, oh yeah, yeah, that would be really helpful for my brother and for his girlfriend who also lived with me. It like, it was a shift and it went back to his desire to keep other people safe too. Like I said, at the beginning of the um, talk, is it that innate desire? And so it's really about that. And it is involving the other people, the partners, the roommates, and showing them how to use it. It's very easy. Again, though, now it's no longer a one and done. It's anywhere between four and six doses, depending on what people are using. So just making sure when you show up, you bring a bag of lots. And if you need Narcan or access to Narcan, um, please reach out for my email. I like helping people find that in their uh, community. So um, please reach out and I would love to do that for you. Um, next substance is meth. So I think the big thing about meth is uh, more than any other substance and a population that I've worked with is the judgment around people who use meth. So what I discovered when I was working in the hospital, if I could show up for people who were actively using meth with no judgment and be the one person who wasn't um, giving them a hard time about this choice, uh, it really helped the conversation. And then, um, you know, checking in with people using meth about the basics. Um, are they eating? Are they drinking water? Are they sleeping? What are the basic needs? What does their living situation look like? Do they have electricity? Are they, um, are their relationships bad? Like what's going on at home and how can we help there? And the mental health check-in is massive for people using meth. What's going on? Like, what uh, is there psychosis? Are you hearing things? Is it okay when you're hearing things? A lot of times when we're hearing things, that's not bad. If somebody's hearing voices, we can't assume that those voices are bad. So what does it look like? Are they doing all right in that department? And do they need help? I know for me, I opened a door for a friend of mine accidentally because he was in meth psychosis. And I just met him at a park and hung out with him like we do as peers. And, and then because of our conversation, he was able to go back home and his um, roommate took him to Unity, which is a mental health hospital here, just to chill out and to like not be in psychosis for a few days. And so having that mental health check-in just to see where people are, super helpful. Again, clean needles and that conversation of alternative routes of use, super huge for people with meth. And then talking to people um, who use meth about fentanyl being in meth. Again, I have met folks who are active in their meth addiction who like the new meth with fentanyl. So acknowledging that and honoring that, but also for the ones who don't, making sure that there's access to testing strips, which in and of itself is controversial, but I'll get into that later. And then fresh pipes too. One of the things that we found here doing this work is, um, uh, Fresh pipes were great to, for the communities who were unhoused, not only for the basics, but um, to stop the uh, spread of COVID as well. So those things. Now, fresh pipes and testing strips fall under this ridiculous category of drug paraphernalia. So here in Oregon, wrap your brains around this sucker, is that uh, you know uh, decriminalization has happened with substances, which is awesome. Um, but somewhere along the way, we forgot to decriminalize paraphernalia. 
So theoretically, you could get arrested for having pipes or fentanyl testing strips, but not be arrested for having meth in your pocket. So go figure. If you want to write um, a angry spirited letter to any legislator that you know in your area about this, I think you should do that because that would help me get more testing strips to people who need them. Um, uh, alcohol. So alcohol is a big one. You know, I think we need to honor uh, the health problems and um, the massive strain on our emergency rooms and at basically every uh, public system because of alcohol. It is everywhere. Um, and it also has a very powerful lobby that works around the clock to make it seem like no big deal and to make make it seem um, more accessible than ever. I think alcohol spiked massively during the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and so the first thing we talk about with uh, harm reduction and alcohol is really seeing if they're open to drinking less. Maybe instead of seven nights a week, give the old liver and yourself a break. Try six. What does that look like? Could you even do that? Is that something that you're interested in? Or maybe even just like instead of five drinks, maybe one day a week you do four or half a bottle of wine instead of full bottle. You know, what does that look like? Is that something you're willing to do? Would that be helpful? Switching alcohols to maybe something a little bit more chill instead of just doing the straight up tequila like your buddy Sean here used to do. Maybe like doing less, right? Is that something that's even available? And then a lot of times, if you drank like me, you'd say no. So then it moves into like the safety conversation about driving, about physical safety, about, you know, confrontations or any other stuff that happened while you're drinking. So just really having that conversation about safety. What does the safety look like and personal safety look like while someone's drinking? And how do we help there? Uh, the physical health check-in, while mental health check-in was big for folks who use meth, I think the physical health check-in for people who are active in their alcohol use disorders is massive. You know, uh, any hospital peer or any peer in public health can tell you there is a huge spike in people who are very young um, having end-stage uh, organ failure because of alcohol. I work with a lot of people, too many, uh, 22, 20, 24, in terrible shape with the uh, problems from drinking that people three times their age have, have. So I think it's really checking in, like, how are they feeling? What's going on inside because of your drinking? Do you need to go to the emergency room? And then on that too, really stressing the um, withdrawal dangers. There was a big... Uh, I think with a lot of things being shut down, there was lots of talk about how uh, there was an increase in seizures because of people quit, quitting alcohol suddenly, suddenly and then going into seizure. Uh, and alcohol withdrawal, you guys all know this, but it can kill you. And so making sure our peers, our people that we work with, they know that, making sure that they know like, hey, if you're going to cut down, tell somebody and um, maybe go somewhere to detox and don't do it alone. And then substance by substance, everything else, right? So um, benzos, huge issue everywhere that has a methadone clinic and everywhere in general. I don't know if you all know this, but from 1970 on, I think uh, Valium was the most prescribed drug in this country. And then after Valium tapered off, <laughs> the second most prescribed drug in this country was Xanax. So we have several generations of people hooked on benzos. And additionally to that, we have these street press benzos. The street press benzos, most of them contain fentanyl. So just making sure we have that conversation about people if they want to get testing strips. You know, the thing about the testing strips, there's this freak out that like, oh my God, we're going to have to put all my drugs in there and then test it. Everything that I've read recently, the brand new stuff, the size of a strawberry seed, that's not even a strawberry seed, that's even too big, but the size of a strawberry seed is what I've read from like a scientist, it's in the LA Times, you could look it up, I'm lazy, I don't have the link on me, but that's the last thing I heard. 
is so very tiny. A very tiny amount will be able to read if there's fentanyl in it. Again, benzos like our buddy alcohol, the withdrawal will kill you because of seizures. So making sure they have support if they want to cut down or stop completely. Cocaine, um, MDMA, and ketamine are now all laced with fentanyl. So making sure people know with those substances to get some testing strips. We had a scary incident over the summer. I had connected with a local rave promoter who wanted, he started to see people overdose and die inside of his little party community. And so I hooked him up with some testing strips. Um, and he called me the next week and said, you know, you saved some girl's life because we had a little booth set up where people could test their drugs. And she had bought some ketamine that was loaded in uh, fentanyl. So just making sure people have access to that. Two, with the mental health check-in with things like people who chronically use ketamine and cocaine, um, just making sure that they're doing okay and what do they need. Um, I know for me, I was having massive panic attacks at the height of my cocaine use. And it would have been nice if somebody said like, hey, buddy, maybe we can get you to cut down or change your, the way that you're using so you're not experiencing all this mental health stuff. So same, and um, ketamine as well, same thing. Ketamine's bigger than it was before. Very crazy for me as the person who used drugs in the 90s to see it come back, but it's all over the place. So just having those conversations. And then other prescription drugs, you know, uh, prescription drugs are everywhere. There's particularly with young people having access to their parents' stuff, just finding out what people are using and making sure um, there's somebody else in their life that knows what they're using. And so if something happens, they can get them the um, appropriate help. And then I want to bring it back to the most important part of this conversation. You, you people who have, work in this field or have people in your lives um, and who uh, face this all the time, you know, uh, I think it's important to remember like all this affects us. And so when we have these conversations, we have to take care of ourselves too. It can be triggering, it can be hard, but I think like it's worth it. And then, you know, we we're only able to care for people as much as we care for ourselves. So making sure whatever that looks like to take care of yourself before uh, having these conversations is very important. And with that, I am going to open it up for thoughts and questions. Thank you guys so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sean. That was really great. Um, there are several questions in the chat. And also, I just wanted to say lots of gratitude in the chat towards you for the information you shared and for sharing your personal stories to lots of people really appreciating that. Um, all right. So first question, um, someone asked, do you have any recommendations for providing harm reduction advice to someone who denies giving you information about their use? Like, what can you say minimally without having much information about what the person might really need help with? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it, that goes back to the non-judgment piece, right? Of just approaching it from a like, because nobody wants to be judged. And so just approaching it from a place of saying like, hey, look, this is what's available if you need it. And opening that door instead of hopping in and, you know, I mean, I think our, our desire as people in fear, we want to shake people and say, oh my God, what are you doing? <laughs> but the, the reverse of that is like, here are the options. I know you're saying it's not a big deal, and which is great. But if it becomes a big deal, here's some things. And, and then kind of leaving it there. Mm -hmm. That's great. That seems great. Okay, next question. How would you tackle or address harm reduction with a pregnant or parenting individual? Is there a different approach you would take or the same approach? So, yeah, I mean, that is a great question. And there is a massive spike in that too. I think uh, there's a lot of programs here in Oregon for that with peers. But uh, again, I think, you know, with a child, an unborn child involved, the fear triples, right? And, and so I think it's really like looking into those resources. This goes to the research piece before 
having that conversation. Is there like a project nurture or a peer run program for people in your area for mothers who use drugs? Maybe getting that info first before you have the conversation and say, hey, look, like, no judgment. I know you want to keep using, but here are these resources for you um, while you're pregnant to keep you and your baby safe. So really being able to do that because there's, there's a whole like offshoot of medicine and prenatal medicine helping mothers who are still using. So it, it's not like as stigmatized as I think it was before. Now we just we're back to a place of wanting to keep both individuals safe. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, um, a question about fentanyl test strips, which you, you kind of addressed a little bit, but there are states where those are illegal because they're considered paraphernalia, and some states are trying to look at ways to change that, and someone was wondering how useful really are fentanyl test strips, and maybe what kind of argument could you make for, um, for that? Yeah, yeah, so I, I think, like, uh, there are a lot of, there's a lot of research out there in both places right and I think what we get to do as peers is like the quote-unquote data that we collect is from the voice of the people we serve and so like that I'm currently in a discussion with the Oregon Health Authority about really like writing these stories from the peers that I supervise who have given out these things like the ones I gave out that saved the girl's life who was at the the rave so like I think it begins with that, the advocacy around that of like, hey, here's some real evidence of keeping people safe. And, um, you know, so I, I think it pretty much begins there is being able to present those stories. And um, the advocacy is really about like, this is something that's kept people safe. Why is there a barrier? And I think now like here in Oregon, there is a movement to get it changed and to get um, the drug paraphernalia thing changed. But it's a gray area because they also don't want that to, if they decriminalize all drug paraphernalia, that would also mean like pill crushers, like things to crush pills. And in the fentanyl era, that's, that's pretty controversial. And so it's real gray as far as what that looks like. Uh, but it's not impossible because at one point in time, needles were considered that way too, and that's changed. So I think it's really about um, what people want to use the strips for and how it's kept a certain population safe. For me, I know as like a person who regularly used cocaine, I would not use a testing strip. That would just be something that I wouldn't do. That's <laughs> me being real. But I think for people who are more casual drug users, they're incredibly useful. And those people, particularly people who use them as party drugs, they do use the testing strip. So why have a barrier getting those things to people? Mm -hmm. Great, that's a really great perspective. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, next question. Can you share more information about smoking fentanyl being more risky or maybe point us to a resource where we could read more about it? Yeah, I can do a little resource research and look that up. But so it really has to do with, um, when we talk about the pills, the blue pills, the other kinds of pills, uh, they are hard to inject. It's easier to smoke. The high is quicker. And so, and it being fentanyl, then uh, the deadliness is just that much higher. So uh, it's just the switch in um, the route of use. However, again, with this stuff changing daily, I hear there's... Um, people, there's like a spike again in injecting drugs too. So it's it's a moment by moment thing changing, but I can look up and send maybe if there's a resource page or something, Meg, mm -hmm. um, a, 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 a couple of things that uh, we could read about that and um, that you could look into. I think this is all like what we've just discovered in the field of people smoking and uh, like that, it changes all the time, but I would I would be happy to do that. That'd be great, thank you. Um, okay, next question. Um, can you share any harm reduction strategies regarding xylazine? And maybe to start with, can you say what xylazine is? <laughs> so yeah, okay. Um, me not being like a scientist or a medical right. person, what I can understand about that is that it's it's another synthetic opioid, correct? 
And um, there's also like, like a bunch of offshoots from it. They're all, from what I hear, deadlier than um, uh, fentanyl. And uh, we first started seeing them, I think in like summer of 2021, they were popping up in the South in different places. And now they're kind of all over. Um, I don't know about the Pacific Northwest, if, they, if there's been a big spike in those here, I'm sure there will be. Mm -hmm. um i think it would it would then like uh look like our um idea for fentanyl harm reduction like kind of on steroids right like uh that's really a never using a loan situation and mm -hmm. that's really about uh finding out where you got them i know a lot of people who are ordering this kind of thing as, as well as illegal benzos through the internet um, and, you know, to disastrous results. So really like checking in with our people as far as where they got them mm -hmm. and then how much are they using and, uh, then like what's happening locally in their area, if they're using them and, um, how are people being treated in detoxes and different places just to like address that? Because that's a whole new ball of wax. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, okay, uh, next question. And this is probably a good one because it's certainly something that comes up a lot when you read media stuff about harm reduction. Um, <laughs> do you think that harm reduction is giving people the feeling that drug use is accepted and okay and therefore enabling them to continue use versus trying to get them to stop using? Yeah, and I mean, that's a very real conversation, right? And I think that's what people think of and that it was hit with like a lot when we there was a decriminalization that happened here is that like this like idea that like people were walking around with like trash bags full of meth and it wasn't a big deal here but like no it's not about saying um go ahead and use drugs right it, it's not about co-signing that it's about safety of individuals and when you think from sort of since I work a lot with hospitals, I sometimes have to put my brain in this space of being more administrative. And when you think more administratively, like, and uh, as far as a cost effective thing, harm reduction makes a lot of sense. If somebody keeps showing up in the emergency room, there's a guy I worked with when I was at OHSU who showed up eight times and he was never given access to Narcan or clean needles. Lo and behold, when he was connected with a peer and got clean needles and got Narcan and a social worker, he didn't come back to the emergency room. So I think like it's really about keeping people safe. It's really about cutting down on how the strain on the system, that's like a, a benefit of harm reduction that's unintentional is the strain on the system is cut down. And that's why hospitals are behind it now is that like if they can connect people to a way to safely use as opposed to continuing this cycle of showing up in emergency rooms. Um, they're all for it now, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think it's really, it, it, that also has to do with stigma and that's really checking our own stigma and bias of like, oh my God, we're just like letting people use drugs. Well, so what if we were? Mm -hmm we're letting people own guns, you know? So like, what, so what if we were, and what does that look like? And what, where is it coming from for me where, where I'm having fear about that? Why, how can I turn the lens back on me and be like, what, why am I having this reaction? What, what's happening? If somebody want, if that's somebody's desire is to use heroin, I realized that like specifically when it was people who were end of life, it's like, okay, well, I guess I got to honor that wish, right? And I, and if one person hears that and realizes that they are worthy of care and they still have rights as a patient and as an individual, even though they use drugs, then I think that's pretty important. Mm -hmm.
Great. Um, so we're almost at one o'clock. I'm just going to read this comment to you because I think it's such a great um, summary, basically, of what you just said, too. And it's um, all of this information was helpful and helped me to see that it's not nosy to ask if someone is using alone or has clean needles or needs naloxone. It's actually caring. I see harm reduction in a new light and different forms thanks to this webinar. Amazing job. And thank you. And I feel the same way, Sean. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I did also want to mention lots of people shared a bunch of really cool resources in the chat. And I'm going to pull all of those out and I'll send them in that email later today so everyone has those in a little Word document or something. Um, and we'll have the slides and a link to the recording coming later today. And next month, our webinar is going to be about um, how the addiction workforce can work with reporters to try to reduce stigma about reporting uh, about addiction in the media. So that one, watch for some information coming soon on that. And thank you so much, Sean. That was a really great webinar. Appreciate it so much. Thank you guys so much. Have a great day, everybody.